It's good to see you tonight. I invite you to take your Bibles to Romans. We're continuing our study in the book of Romans tonight, and we're going to deal with Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7. And the title of my sermon tonight is Your Government and You. Verse 1 of Romans 13 says, Let every soul be subject unto higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist receive to themselves damnation. Now, the, the, the Apostle Paul is going to be dealing with a touchy issue here when he talks about our relationship to government. A recent poll showed that 73% of Americans distrust government. 73%. Uh, there's a basic distrust uh, in our country, and perhaps even a rebellion against uh, our government and law enforcement in some places. And quite frankly, some of the distrust is understandable and justifiable due to a lot of the abuse of power that some hold in positions of authority. And then some of it is just simply rebellion, again, from a depraved heart. It's an expression of the rebellion of a depraved heart that doesn't want to be under any authority. But the question is, what does the Bible say about all of this? What are we to do? What's our attitude to be as believers towards government? How should I respond uh, when I perceive that there's injustice in, even in the government? And at first glance, Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7, may seem out of context. Uh, Paul kind of shifts subjects with no transition or introduction. At, at the end of chapter 12, he was dealing with how to live at peace. Uh, he was dealing with uh, don't take vengeance into your own hands. Don't leave that up to God. Uh, he is talking about, um, you know, loving others around us and living peaceably. Uh, and so, in fact, look in chapter 12. He says in verse 19, he said, or actually back up to verse 18. He said, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And then in verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will, will repay, saith the Lord. And I don't think it's any accident, but from there he goes right into chapter 13, where he says to believers to be subject to uh, government authority. Now, the, the political situation in Rome was explosive. I know that there are people that are dissatisfied with government today. Uh, they're dissatisfied with some of our leaders but if you think we have it bad, Paul was writing to Roman Christians, and they, of course, in the Roman Empire. And just a few facts to consider in the background of this passage. Number one, Nero was on the throne at the time that Paul wrote this. I would venture to say that Nero uh, has probably been worse than ever any president we've ever had in office. The Roman state did many evil things in its court system. It was based on social class. It was biased. It was prejudiced against slaves. It was prejudiced against minorities. Another thing to consider that when Paul wrote this, the people were under heavy taxation at the time. Taxes were used to finance all of Rome's projects all throughout the empire, which included uh, roads and temples devoted to the worship of the emperor. The Romans treated their emperors as if they were gods, and when they died, they would dedicate temples to them. And guess what? Their, tax, their taxes paid for that. And so it was, it was difficult to live in that context if you were a Christian. Christianity kind of suffered a blow when in the, in the city of Rome, there was a dispute with some of the Orthodox Christians. At the time, Claudius was the emperor of Rome, and he expelled many Jews and Christians from the city because they simply couldn't get along. And it was over the issue of Christ. Orthodox Jews ref refused to embrace the fact that Christ was the Messiah. Christians stood up for Christ as the Messiah, and there was a dispute in the city. And so uh, Claudius just simply expelled many from the city. The Romans knew that the founder of Christianity was Jesus Christ, this relatively new sect of people. They believed that he was killed because he claimed to be king, and perhaps even a rival to Caesar himself. And so they knew that there was, they thought in their own mind at least, there was potential trouble with these new Christians, this group that refused to give any loyalty to any other king except for Jesus Christ himself. And although they somewhat tolerated Christianity in the Roman Empire at that time, 
they kept a very close eye on believers. They thought that they were subversive. In fact, in, in Acts chapter 17, verses 6 and 7, some unbelieving Jews, listen to what they said. They said, these that have turned the world upside down are come here also. And, there are all, and they all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is no other king, well, there is one king, and that's Jesus. And so there was the belief that Christians was that Christians were uh, intolerant of any other king, and that therefore they were somewhat suspicious. They could lead a insurrection, a rebellion, and so Rome was keeping a really close eye on both Jews who were at that time many hard to uh, to bring under civil obedience, and then also they were keeping a close eye on Christians. Now, again, the, the Romans were somewhat tolerant of Christianity, but they associated Jews and Christians together, and many of the Jews were giving Christianity a bad name because they were so subversive. And this is all the background in which Paul is writing this letter. He's trying to tell believers, here's how you behave in a, with your relationship to the government, a government that was far less than perfect, a government that was corrupt, a government that had many corrupt leaders in it. How are we to respond to that? And that's the issue in these next verses here. What is our role and our responsibility before God to human government? Now, let me just say before we get into it, of course, we know in Scripture, the Bible does teach that there are times when civil disobedience becomes necessary. Uh, we understand the Bible says in the book of Acts when they basically beat Peter and John and said, you know, don't say anything more about this Jesus. They charged them not to mention Jesus' name or say anything more about Jesus. And what was their response? We ought to obey God rather than man. Our highest loyalty is to God. And when you give us a law that would force us to go against our conscience and against the command, the clear command of Scripture, we have to defer to God and we, would much, we are going to obey God rather than man. So we know that the Bible does teach there are times when it is appropriate, when it is necessary, when we have no choice but to exercise civil disobedience. And even there, we have to do it in a way where we are representing our Lord and we need to do it in a gracious way. But really what Paul is going to give us here in Romans chapter 13 is the general principles. This is really the default mode of believers. This is what our attitude is to be towards civil government. And what I want you to see what we're going to talk about is the responsibility and then the reasons and then the rendering. So this outline is very simple. The responsibility, the reasons, and then the rendering. Number one, the responsibility, and Paul's very clear and straightforward in verse number one when he says, Let every soul be subject unto higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And Paul is establishing this basic principle. That whatever the form or whoever the ruler, civil government should be obeyed and submitted to by Christians. Christians have this duty. And again, I remind you that Nero was on the throne at the time that the Apostle Paul wrote this. When he said, let every soul be subject unto higher powers. This is the principle. It is unqualified. It is unlimited. It is unconditional. In fact, the phrase every soul is a Hebraism. It really just means every person, every individual. No one's exempt from this. Each of us has this very precise duty. And look at the word be subject. It's an imperative. Again, this is not a suggestion. This is a command. God commands us. It's imperative. You be subject. Hupostasio is the term here. It's a military term. It means to line up under, to take your orders the idea of submission, every one of us should get in line, submit to those who are over us, who, who is that higher power, that authority. It tells us, um, there's actually a double phrase in the Greek, exousios, and then hyper exousios. They are the higher powers. They are the supreme powers in the sense of earthly rule. That's what he means when he says, higher powers. In verse 3, he calls them rulers. And so this text makes no distinction between good rulers and bad rulers or fair laws or unfair laws. There's no such thing as a perfect government. As I said, we won't have that until our Lord Jesus Christ returns. 
In fact, it was the obedience of Christians to unfair laws and unfair rulers in times of persecution that brought about the tolerance of Rome and the acceptance of Rome to Christianity. It was their, it was their submission. It was their, their, their ability to uh, lay aside hostility and simply submit, even when it was unreasonable. That brought about the toleration of Christianity in Rome. Now, Peter also taught this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. He said, "...is having your behavior honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation." In other words, this is the same context. Peter is writing to Roman Christians who are under uh, unjust rulers. And he says, uh, when they speak evil of you, let it be a lie. Don't let it be the truth. Don't give them anything." That is legitimate to speak against you. But how are you to promote goodness in the society that wants to per persecute you? It says later on in verse 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers. Uh, we could say the police. For so is the will of God that with well doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Foolish men are constantly looking for something to criticize. Your lack of good citizenship and obedience to civil authority, Peter said, will give them a reason. Don't give them a reason. And then he says, don't use your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. And so Peter told a persecuted group, group of believers, look, be obedient, be submissive. Uh, in fact, he pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you remember in First Peter, he points to the cross of Christ. But when he points to the cross of Christ, he's not pointing to the cross with respect to evangelism. He's pointing to the cross as an example of how we are to suffer or how we are to act and respond towards a corrupt and unjust government. Because it was a corrupt and unjust government that crucified Christ. And Peter says, well, how did Jesus respond? Look at him. Look at his life. You talk about injustice. Beloved, no one suffered more injustice in this world than Jesus did. No one was more persecuted unjustly than Jesus was. But what was his response? And Peter says, that's the example that you are to follow. Uh, in fact, just, just go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and look at this real quick in the context. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and notice what... Peter says the response of the Lord was, and look at verse number 21 of 1 Peter chapter 2. Well, actually, back up to verse 20. For what glory is it if when you're buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, and you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. There's no virtue in you being punished for your faults, and you take that patiently. You deserve that. But if you do well, and you're unjustly punished for it, and you take that patiently, Peter said, that's acceptable with God. Because look, and then he, look who he points to in verse 21. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow what? In his steps. You follow the example of your Savior. In what way? Verse 22, who did, not, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. And this is all talking about how Jesus was treated during this trial, when he was brought to uh, before the governor, uh, before Pilate, and he was unjustly tried and he was crucified. Because it says in verse 21, who his own, or verse 24 rather, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes are healed. And Peter says, look, if you want an example on how to suffer injustice, look at Jesus. Look at his example. Notice how he committed himself to the one who judges righteously. Just be reminded that God the Father, nothing gets past him. He sees everything. And he himself will judge righteously. And so Paul says, be subject unto higher powers. 
Because this is your responsibility. Why? Well, this is point number two, the reasons. Why should we be submissive? The reasons. And Paul gives several reasons for our submission. Here's the first one. Because government is ordained by God. It's ordained by God. Look again at verse 1. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Paul says there's no power but of God, period. That means there's no power in existence that isn't reflective of God's power, his will, or his authority. No civil government exists in any nation, in any part of the world, apart from God. The psalmist said in Psalm 62, verse 11, power belongs unto the Lord. Anyone who possesses any kind of sovereignty on earth, any kind of earthly power, it has been delegated to them by God. And it's been allowed to them by God. And you can best believe they will answer for how they use that authority. They will answer for that. But nevertheless, it was delegated to them by God. Remember when Jesus stood before Pilate? Uh, and the Bible says in John nineteen ten, Then said Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not I have power to crucify thee? And have power to release thee. Here's a pathetic scene in the gospel if you ask me. Standing before Pilate is all power, the Lord Jesus Christ. The sinless son of God. And here's Pilate boasting about the power that he has. Don't you know that I have power to crucify you? And I have power to release you. Here's Jesus, the innocent, pure son of God. Standing before a corrupt official. Pilate was corrupt. And what did Jesus say? Jesus answered in John 19, 11, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given from above. Pilate, the only power you have has been delegated to you from above. That's the only power that you have. And again, this was a man who was far from being a completely just ruler. In fact, you want to know, know how unjust he was? Even though he knew that Jesus was innocent, he allowed him to be crucified. Even though he knew there was no fault in him. And he even said that. I find no fault. What's the right thing for a leader to do if you find no fault in someone who is brought before you to be judged? It would be to use your power to protect that person and release that person, right? Pilate didn't do that. What did he do? In order to, to save face, he was a true politician. In order for, to save face... He let him be crucified. He let an innocent person suffer. And yet Jesus said, you don't have any power except that we're delegated to you. God will delegate power and allow even corrupt men to occupy positions of authority. Nebuchadnezzar was a cruel person. And yet Daniel said, the most high rules in the kingdom of men. And he gives it to whomsoever he will. And sometimes God will set it up over the basis of men. He'll allow even the basis of men at times to be in positions of authority. But we still have to remember that government is ordained by God. And then secondly, another reason he gives is because resistance is rebellion against God. Look at chapter 2. Look in verse, the first part of chapter 2. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And the word ordinance here uh, is a word that means institute. Uh, the, the Greek word for resist is antitasso. It is used here in the perfect tense. We could read the verse, whoever has and continues to have a permanent attitude of resistance against the government is resisting God. That's literally how we could render that verse. And so it really doesn't matter if the ruler is good or evil or a persecutor of Christians or a lover of Christians, elected by people or appointed by a Senate, or whatever way in which it took place where he was in that position of authority, uh, we are to submit, Paul says. Submit to that authority. And we see this in the life of David, his actions towards Saul. When Saul, we talk about another corrupt official, there was Saul. And he wasn't obeying God. He was very selfish. And he wanted to kill David for no reason. David had done no sin. David had done nothing against 
uh, Israel or the government of Israel. And yet here was Saul using all his resources to hunt down an innocent man. Here's another corrupt a government official. And you remember the story when Dave was in En Gedi, he was hiding in a cave and Saul went in to relieve himself. The Bible says, and David was there and David's men uh, was there in the cave with him. And here's Saul and he doesn't know David's there and David's men are having a conversation with him. In my mind, I always picture that they're whispering there in the background. Hey man, here he is. God delivered him up for you. I mean, here he is, man. Praise God. I thought, I, I think maybe some of them in the cave started to sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Because here's Saul, he's right there. All you have to do is just stick the sword in him, kill him. You're the king. And David recognized that that was not the right thing to do. That Saul, even though he was corrupt, even though he was doing what is wrong, was still in that position ordained by God. And he refused to lay his hand against the Lord's anointed. In fact, later on, David continued to honor Saul even after he died. When he died, David wept. That's the spirit. That's the attitude of someone who has uh, the heart of God. David was called a man after God's own heart. And so Paul says we are to submit because government is ordained by God, because resistance is really a rebellion against God. And number three, because resistance results in judgment. Look again in verse two, where it says, and they that resist shall receive to themselves what? Damnation. Crema. Judgment. That's the word there. Crema. Judgment. It's the same word used in the New Testament to speak of a judgment from God. It's referring to a judicial punishment and sentencing. It, it is to be seen as a judgment from God. God has ordained government authorities to punish evildoers. And basically, the Bible just pres prescribes several means of punishment. If you look through the scripture, you're going to find out what's, what are some of those mean. Number one, there's restitution. For lesser crimes, the Bible says that there is to be restitution for any crime committed. And then there's also corporal punishment. This is also for lesser crimes. And then the Bible also prescribes capital punishment for crimes, which, of course, is death. And the object in punishment was well, there was a lot. First of all, it was it was a matter of justice. It was to deter a crime. It was a restraint on the criminal himself, and it allowed for rehabilitation. The, the penalty was paid, and the person was able to reestablish their credibility by making restitution and paying uh, the, 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 the proper uh, punishment for their crime so they could continue with life. Let me just say it wasn't to put into, into prison with other criminals which I think we do today, we, we, take, we take people with offenses, we put them in, in prison with criminals, and they learn from other criminals how to be a better criminal. And that's a lot of what happens in our prison system today. Immediate punishment also prevented private vengeance. So in the Bible, whenever there was a punishment for a crime, it was done immediately. I think about our system today, when a person commits a crime, they, they wait a long time before they stand before a judge. A long time. In the Bible, the punishment was immediate. And prisons, I don't see anywhere in Scripture where prisons are, are endorsed. Uh, one man wrote this, quote, instantaneously payment of the penalty was exacted for all criminals, talking about the biblical principle, severe punishment, such as lashes and whippings were given. Then the opportunity to make restitution was also given, which restored the man's dignity. Now, I don't want to get into all of this because I know there may be some who disagree on, on this very principle. But I think we have to ask ourselves the question today, do prisons work? Do they really work? And for what I see, the answer is no. They seem to be a, a, a breeding ground for worse crimes. And even in prisons, there's this community of crime that continues to go on even in the prison itself. One writer calls the American prison system unbiblical, inhumane, ineffective, inefficient, and idiotic. According to, to recent statistics, we punish 25 out of every 500 criminals 
who commit serious crimes. 25 out of 500. The 25 are punished and put somewhere where they sit for years and do basically nothing except learn how to be a worse criminal by those that are around them. They receive free meals. They're cared for by the state. And this is far from what the Bible says about punishing a punishment for crimes committed. In the Bible, the restitution process was con normally conducted by the the the, uh, the family that was that was sinned against. Uh, he sometimes was assigned to a family where he worked out his restitution. It was a way to restore that person's dignity and character. But again, the, just write down Ecclesiastes 8.11. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. When you don't punish a crime immediately, justly, with a way to restore, then what it does is it just causes the evil heart of man to get even worse. And their heart then is fully set in them to continue to do evil. Nevertheless... Government is supposed to punish in judgment, but also government restrains evil. The reason we submit is because it's ordained by God, because resistance is rebellion against God, because resistance results in judgment. The government is to punish crime, but also it restrains evil. This whole process is supposed to restrain evil. Again, it's very ironic to me that the governments that are supposed to restrain evil, sometimes they don't even really accomplish that. Sometimes they may even encourage it. I know this, this sermon is not going to be one of my most popular sermons. But I'm not running for any office. The government is supposed to restrain evil. Look in chapter or 13, verse 3, where it says, For the rulers are not a terror to good works, Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to the good works, but to the what? To the evil. Scripture teaches that God uses government. It is his tool, even imperfect, less than perfect governments, even corrupt governments. God still uses them to restrain the evil that is innate in every person, the sinful heart of man. It's to restrain the evil that is in man's heart. Now, I told you before, there are several tools that God uses to restrain evil. The one is conscience. Right after Adam and Eve sinned, they felt guilt. Uh, it was because of the conscience. The conscience is a gift from God to help us restrain the evil that is in us. I know today we treat guilt like it's a negative emotion. But when your conscience is working, you feel guilty. That's a good thing. Because that guilt is designed to drive you where? To drive you to God. But, of course, today we're conditioned to ignore the guilt. Or to blame it on someone else. Or try to rid ourselves of the guilt. Rather than allow, allowing that guilt, that feeling of guilt to drive us to God, we rather, we take, we take a, a prescription for it. Or we try to ignore it. And it's meant to drive us to the Lord. That's the conscience. And you should, if you feel guilty for something you did wrong, you should thank God. Because that means your conscience, at least your conscience, is still working right. And allow that to drive you to the Lord. That conscience is there to, to keep, to restrain evil that is in you. And then there's also family. God has given the family unit as a way to restrain evil. Parents are responsible to teach their children right from wrong. And then there's also, of course, the church. Perhaps the greatest institution in the world today that restrains evil is the church. You know why? Because the church preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it is the power of the gospel that does what? It changes hearts. I want to tell you, there is no government system that will ultimately work without the gospel. You say, oh, we live, we live in a democracy. Well, okay, yeah, a republic or a democracy where we get to vote and, but I want to tell you, a democracy only works if the people in it are good. It only works then. Because if you get pe bad people uh, in a democracy, then that whole thing is bad. A democracy only works when the heart of people is, when the hearts are good. And the hearts can only be made good by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I tell you, the reason this nation is even still functioning today is because of the foundation of the gospel that it's had throughout the years.
I believe that's the only reason we're still even in business today is because the gospel has that preserving. We are the salt, right? We preserve from corruption the church. The only reason there's even still some shred of decency in our world today is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to me, it's very ironic that evil people in the world and even the government sometimes itself will attack the church. The very thing that's preserving this whole thing. And they, they turn on it, but that's such as what the Bible says would happen. But then the other thing that God uses to restrain evil is the government itself. That's one of the, that's the, the major function. I think when God ordained human government, it was given to restrain evil. Paul says, for the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. And then he goes on to say, wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? And the word for afraid, fear, phobos, where we get the word phobia, it kind of has the idea of a terror. And Paul is saying that government is not a terror to people who do good. At least it shouldn't be. But government is a terror to those who do evil works, a class of deeds that are inherently evil. And let me just say this, by the way. When the government doesn't function the way it should, according to the scripture, it's the job of the church to call the government out. The church is to be the, the conscience of the state. I just got tell, done telling you the conscience is inside of us, and it, it, it tells us when we do wrong. I believe that it is part of the role of the church and even preachers is when the government goes wrong, we should call them out on it. We should be there to tell them that's wrong. That is not what the scripture says. And you're not fulfilling your God-ordained role. The, the, the church is to be the conscience of the state. But when, this, when, the, when the government's working correctly, what should happen? What should happen is those who do evil should be afraid. Those who do wrong, they should be in terror, knowing that this God-ordained government will be there to punish them for their evil works. This is the ultimate, again, reason for government is to restrain the evil that is in man when it happens. So because government is ordained by God, because resistance is rebellion, because resistance results in judgment, because government restrains evil, but also because obedience brings approval. Look again in verse 3 where it says, Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. That is, you will be approved, you'll be commended by government for being a lover and doer of what is good. You'll have praise from your government. Thank God for good citizens. Thank God for people that are uh, examples of good citizenship. The government should praise that. They approve that. But then here's another thing, because government is God's servant for good. Look in cha uh, chapter 13, look in verse 4. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. Minister here is where we get our word deacon from, dikonos. He is God's minister. Who's he talking about here? He's talking about government. He's talking about rulers. They're servants of God. Policemen, senators, city councilmen, judges, the president of the United States. The Bible says all of those people that serve in that role of government, they are the minister of God to the for good. And so they might not know God personally. And they may not even understand this very principle that I'm preaching tonight, but they represent God and his desire for peace and safety among men. You know why, you know why judges wore robes, or they still do, I believe? Is because, in a sense, uh, it, it's it's kind of a reverent thing. It's where they understand that they stand in and they represent God in giving out judgment. That's why we need to pray, beloved. We need to pray that God will raise up people that actually fear the Lord, that are in those positions. But here's another thing, because government has authority to use capital punishment. Look again in verse 4. For he is a minister of God to thee for good, but if thou, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in Vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. 
And so when he uses the expression of a sword here, he's, he's, talking, about, he's talking about capital punishment. You don't spank or find people with a sword. What you do with a sword, what do you do with a sword? You kill. You put to death. And so he's talking about the government's authority and right to inflict final punishment. The sword is a symbol for death. And the government has been given the, uh, the power and ability by God to exercise when it is necessary to exercise capital punishment. Now, again, I'm, I realize that for some people this is controversial. Uh, some people don't believe in capital punishment. But I believe that the Bible is very clear on it. I believe the Bible teaches it. Just write down Genesis 9, 6. When God was laying down some basic matters regarding human government, right after Noah and his family got off the ark, God laid down this one principle with reference to human government. Listen, whosoever sheddeth man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. Why? And it goes on to say, because man was created, what? In the image of God. And murder is an attack not just against that individual, but it's an attack against God who created man in his own image. So if someone took the life of a man, that person, what does the Bible say, was to forfeit his own life. And the government should execute that penalty without pity, without partiality, and without delay. And again, I think the Bible is very clear on that. Now, I know that there are people out there and they say, oh, well, you know, capital punishment, it doesn't deter crime and blah, blah, blah. Look, that's not even the point. That's not even the point. That's irrelevant. Uh, the Bible doesn't even mention anything about deterring crime. It just says if a person murders someone else, they are to forfeit their own life. Because that person attacked not just men, but God. And God said they're there to forfeit their own life. And whether it's a deterrent or not, who cares? By the way, I think it is a deterrent, by the way. I know one thing, that person won't uh, kill again. So it is a deterrent in some way. Jesus, I think, supported this in Matthew 26, 52. When Peter took out his sword, remember, he started to attack the soldiers that came to arrest Jesus. And what did Jesus say to him at that time? He said, Peter, put up your sword, put it in its place. For all they that live by the sword shall what? die by the sword. And in that one statement there, the Lord is upholding capital punishment. If you fight with a sword, if you kill, you will die. That's the bottom line. That's the divine institution there. And the government is God's minister to hold back crime by being the bearer of the sword. And, the, and Paul says he does not bear the sword in vain. We just, we just read in Romans chapter 12 where you don't take vengeance in your own hand. You let God take care of that. And what is one of, one of God's ways of executing vengeance? He does it through his institution called human government. You don't have to take matters in your own hand because God has ordained that government serve as his instrument to bring vengeance down upon others. And so as Christians, we thank God that government has the right to use that sword against those who are so evil that they would want to take a life. Because there is a principle in Scripture. And that principle is uh, the blood guiltiness of man. When, when deaths are not satisfied, a nation becomes blood guilty. When there is the shedding of blood, and that blood remains unrequited, that nation becomes guilty. They become blood guilty. And the Bible says that blood cries out to God, not in a literal way, but in a metaphorical way. You remember what God said in Genesis chapter 4, verse 9? He said to Cain, where is thy brother Abel? And what did he say? I, I'm not my brother's keeper. And then the Lord said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now thou art cursed from the earth, which may open her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy Hand. When Cain killed Abel, his blood, Cain's blood cried out to God because it was unrequited. And there's innocent blood that's been shed in our country, and it's been unrequited. And that's why God says a murderer is to lose his own life. That alone will satisfy 
the unrequited blood and in turn satisfy God. But I'll be honest with you, beloved, I, I marvel that God hasn't judged our nation more severely. There's all kind of innocent blood being shed and nothing be done, being done about it. And I think of abortion. I think of that we are in a, a, a nation that has allowed this to go on. And beloved, this is innocent blood. Innocent blood crying out to God. I you know again, it's not a very popular thing to talk about this. But that's why America is in such a mess. Because we have thrown God's word behind us. Because we have allowed this, this the killing of babies in our country. I don't, I'm going to tell you, as a Christian, I could never vote for anyone that's, that's a baby killer. And I can't understand how any Christian could. How can, how can any Christian with a good conscience vote for someone who's for killing babies? I don't get it. Maybe you can explain it to me later. Or better yet, don't even try. Because government is, because submission to government silences the conscience. Look in verse number five. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. When we submit ourselves, then we silence the conscience that is inside of us. And so there's the responsibility. There's the reason. Let me give you the third thing. There's the rendering. There's a the rendering. Look at verse six. For this cause pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Look at verse 7. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor is due. And the word render here in the Greek text is just giving back something that you owe. And that's what you do when you pay taxes. He's talking about taxes here. Tribute is giving taxes. We are to render therefore to them all their dues. Custom to whom custom. We're to give what is required of us as believers to the government, which includes taxes and custom. This is the word teleos. It refers to revenue that was raised. It could be a duty tax or a sales tax that he's talking about here. Whatever. They had all kind of taxes throughout the whole government of Rome. And then it says honor. Fear to whom fear. And really he's talking about honor there. It can mean Respect. We we are to give respect to whom respect is due. And again, Peter said this. He said, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king, and serve and be subject to your masters. And so we are to be respectful in our attitude towards government. And then finally, prayer. We, I could just add on here prayer. We are to pray for our government leaders. But, but Paul is very straightforward here. He's very clear on our attitude towards government. And, and this is something that we need to take to heart, beloved, because as the church, we need to be the example in this world of civil obedience in general. And again, I said there are times when we might have to act in civil disobedience when we are pushed to do something that goes against the word of God and against our conscience. And there we have to stand firmly on the word of God. And we do that for the honor of God, for the glory of God, not out of selfishness or rebellion but in submission to God himself. But other than that, the default mode for every Christian is to have this attitude of submission, knowing that we do it unto the Lord. Again, if you want to know an example, just look at Jesus. Look at how he conducted himself all during his earthly ministry. Let's bow for prayer together tonight. And so, Lord, help us to take to heart what your word says. And, and very honestly, Lord, this, it isn't always easy. It isn't always easy. Lord, sometimes we see the abuse of power. And there's something inside of us that cries out against that. We cry out for justice. When we see those that are in positions of authority who should represent you, who abuse that authority. And it's hard sometimes, Lord. But give us the grace to follow in the footsteps of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Who, when he was tried, when he was treated unjustly, there was no guile found in his mouth. Who committed himself to him who judges righteously.
Lord, give us the grace and the ability to follow our Savior in all these things, to be like Jesus in this. And we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.